Winston Churchill called him a seditious fakir and spoke of the nauseating and humiliating spectacle of his half-naked figure striding up the steps of the Viceroy's palace to parley on equal terms with the representative of the King Emperor. The newsreels called him the little man from India in shawl and loincloth. Albert Einstein believed that his views were the most enlightened of all the political men of our time. Gandhi, known as the Mahatma or Great Soul, was a prophet of nonviolence, whose mystical hold over India's millions gave him greater power than the rulers of the mighty British Raj. that Gandhi sprang from was a country of 300 million souls, a sprawling, untidy mixture of peoples, creeds, and castes, where there were extremes of poverty and wealth unknown to the rest of the world. At the top were the English, the most exclusive caste of all, whose pride was not in their riches or their power, but in their assumption of racial superiority. Gandhi was born into a business family in Gujarat, Western India. But he was not interested in business himself. Instead, he went to England to study law and tried to turn himself into a model English gentleman. At the same time, he developed strong interests in religious truth and moral virtue. In South Africa, where he served for 21 years, these interests gradually occupied his entire life to the great initial distress of his wife whom he had married when they were both 13. In South Africa, Gandhi worked out his program of soul force, and he learned that it was a program that could lead a vast people in the quest for self-respect, for dignity, even perhaps for freedom. And it was with that program that he returned to India, determined to challenge the greatest power of the time, the British Raj. The British in India had no obvious answer to Gandhi's challenge, except to jail him, which was exactly what Gandhi's soul force was ready for. The power of persuasion. This was what he practiced all of his life, that if you believed in something strongly, then through the power of persuasion, through the power of love, through the power of resisting the wrong but not fighting the wrong, that you could ultimately win your opponent over to your side. And this, I think, was essentially the power of soul force. All his adult life, Gandhi practiced a strict asceticism, which gave him unrivaled moral power over people who venerate holy men. At the same time, he advanced practical ideas, like the simple hand weaving of cloth, as a non-violent challenge to Britain. Here is the machine gun of the non-violence movement in India and the key to independence. It is known as Takri, a substitute for the spinning wheel. Cotton is grown, clean and supplied in India by Indian labor. Spinning is very easy and can be learned by anyone even a child in a few days. If a man 
works at Takali, during his spare moment, he will be able to spin 400 yards of yarn, which is sufficient to supply his own clothing and thus eliminate the purchasing of foreign cloth. Through some mysterious power of communication, Gandhi had become widely known in India even before he began his active political campaign. The success of his call for non-violent resistance astonished India and shook the British. Non-cooperation could take many forms, work stoppages, boycotts, and most famous of all, a march to the sea to demonstrate peaceful defiance of Britain's monopoly on the manufacture of salt. But of course there were outbreaks of violence and Gandhi knew that crowds could get out of hand. He willingly accepted imprisonment believing that such punishment hurts those who inflict it more than those who suffer it. Early in 1931, Gandhi was released from prison in order to attend a conference in London on India's future. It was a measure of his success in giving such powerful expression to the aspirations of India's masses that in preparation for the conference, he was invited to meet the Viceroy, Lord Irwin. We have been faced with difficulties, some that we might have foreseen and perhaps avoided, some that were inherent in the conditions with which we have to deal. The judgment of all this must be left to the cold and impartial days of history, by the verdict of which, for my own part, I am well content to abide. If you go to the second round table conference, uh, will you go attired in native Indian dress, or will you prefer European dress? I shall certainly not be found in European dress, and if the weather permitted, I should uh, uh, present myself exactly as I am today. Yes. And if the King of England invited you to uh, dinner at Buckingham Palace, you would go in your customary Indian dress. In any other dress, dress I should be uh, most discourteous to him. Are you prepared to return to jail again? I am always prepared to return to jail. <laughs> the Salt March had made Gandhi world famous. In Britain, the appearance of this weird figure roused feelings of curiosity, affection and respect among all kinds of people. But the conference itself was not a success. Despite the windbag eloquence of Britain's socialist prime minister, Ramsay MacDonald. And finally, I hope, and I trust and I pray, that by our labors together, India will possess the only thing which she now lacks, to give her the status of a dominion amongst the British Commonwealth of Nations. Freedom, Gandhi once wrote, is often to be found inside a prison's walls even on a gallows, never in council chambers, courts, and classrooms. What she now lacks for that, the responsibility and the care, <coughs> the burden and the difficulties, <coughs> but the pride and the honor of responsible there was one man for whom Gandhi and all he stood for was a portent of disaster. Winston Churchill refused to meet him. Ladies and gentlemen, are you following the Indian situation with the attention it demands? It is your duty as citizens of the British Empire, bearing a share in its responsibilities, to form a clear opinion and make up your minds what ought to be done. Things are going from bad to worse. Great mismanagement and weakness are causing unrest and disturbance to 300 million primitive people whose well-being is in our care. The Indian danger will raise a crisis equal in importance 
two of the greatest events in the history of Great Britain. But Gandhi was Churchill's equal in the art of political propaganda. Gandhi was going to be the same half-naked figure in dress, in manner, as he was in India. But he was going to be this sort of person, not in India, but in Buckingham Palace in the presence of His Majesty the King. And then he was going in the east end of London where he was staying and on a visit to Lancashire to the textile district. He was going to mingle with the masses and he immediately won attention and the cameras were there and the reporters were there. And this was shown in movie screens all over the world. Nobody understood him, but he conveyed that he was a man of the people. I remember, I remember, I love you are family. going to tell the other children that I love you all as my own children. That's all I want to say. <laughs> I finished my speech. You have. <laughs> he loves all the children of the world. He didn't say that. I said that I love you all the children as my own. Sorry, sorry. Are you a I have come back empty-handed, Gandhi told the crowds waiting for him at Bombay. Ahead lay further periods of imprisonment, interspersed with a series of fasts, as Gandhi wrestled with the plight of India's untouchables. Certainly his fasts were political weapons. I think he really felt that they were the only ways that he could stop bloodshed that he could stop labor dissension, but at the same time he knew that this method would create sympathetic attention to his cause throughout the world, and it did. People who never who knew nothing about India, and very little about the Mahatma, were electrified. They waited at their radios for the latest news of the Mahatma when he was on a fast. Is he going to die? Are the British going to give in? What's going to happen? Gandhi's unique position was a vital source of power to more politically ambitious men like Nehru. Nehru recognized the validity, the power of Gandhi's weapon of soul force. Although he didn't completely subscribe to it, he recognized how it could achieve certain ends. Not so, however, the governor of Bombay. In this great issue which we are fighting today, there can be no doubt about the ultimate answer. The real voice of the people is behind the government at present established by law. So will it be behind the new government which will stand for fair and equal opportunities for all castes, creeds and communities. The British were unable to make Gandhi out. Not for them the methods of a Hitler or a Stalin. The British recognized that Gandhi was a foe as an outspoken champion of self-government, of human dignity, that they might have to imprison him, but also that he had to be treated seriously with dignity. For the second time in Gandhi's lifetime, Britain's war became India's too by a proclamation of the Viceroy. The Indians themselves were not consulted, but most joined in willingly enough. There was a lot of love-hate in Gandhi's attitude toward the British. He supported them in three wars, in the Boer War in South Africa when he was there, in the First World War and in the Second World War, but at the same time in the Second World War, Gandhi said, I support the British, but on the other hand, he called the Quit India Movement, which was perhaps the biggest civil disobedience campaign of India of all time. He was telling the British, I support you, but now in your moment of weakness, you've got to get out. The Japanese armies at India's gates the British responded forcefully. 
Gandhi was again arrested. Before calling the Quit India campaign, Gandhi had rejected a British offer which promised eventual independence. Considering it had Churchill sanction, the offer was generous. Gandhi's rejection of it played into the hands of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the leader of India's 90 million Muslims, who were bent on having their own independent state. Jinnah's single-mindedness made him as powerful as Gandhi, for whom he had nothing but contempt, calling him a cunning fox, a Hindu revivalist. Jinnah was the one person whom Gandhi couldn't overcome, who he couldn't surmount. Most of the people who worked with Gandhi, Nehru, Sardar Patel, others, they didn't subscribe to Gandhi's ideals, but they recognized that what Gandhi was preaching was necessary for the one aim that they had in common, which was independence from Britain. Jinnah also wanted independence, but Jinnah wasn't subscribing to Gandhiism at all. He just completely rejected the ideals and he rejected the man. And Jinnah insisted, and he won out on the one thing which was complete anathema to the Mahatma, partition of the country to allow the Muslims to have their own country called Pakistan. And this division to Gandhi was perhaps the greatest defeat of his life, because while he wanted independence, yes, he also wanted unity. And when he couldn't have both, independence alone simply wasn't enough. So Gandhi stayed in the background, but he was always not very far in the background, because every night after the talks, Nehru, Sardar Patel, the others on the Congress side, would talk to the Mahatma to get his views. And he'd give his views, and his views were primarily that he didn't want any part of it. The war over, the new socialist leaders of Britain were determined indeed to quit India, and as quickly as possible. Their agent would be a new viceroy, the former Allied commander in Southeast Asia, the glamorous Admiral Lord Mountbatten. Mountbatten immediately cultivated the confidence of India's leaders, particularly Gandhi, whom he described as a sweet, sad sparrow. Gandhi had spent more than six years of his life in British prisons, but now that independence was in the offing, his power to shape the future was dwindling. Forces had been released which were beyond the control of Viceroy or Mahatma. Independence was accompanied by scenes of unbelievable savagery as the centuries-old fabric of Indian life was torn apart. The death toll of Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs was estimated at one million. Communal rioting, bloodshed, the message was clear that freedom alone wasn't good enough unless there could be brotherhood. And in getting people to live together, to respect not just themselves, but to respect each other, in that, Gandhi failed. To get it over with quickly, Mountbatten accelerated the timetable for the transfer of power. He set August 15, 1947 as the date for independence. Nehru was now the man of the hour, while Gandhi remained in Calcutta, where he did what he could to restrain violence. When if freedom was ultimately agreed upon, Gandhi refused to remain in the capital for its advent, because while he certainly wasn't going to reject it, he wanted to make clear that he disapproved of it heartily because it meant that India was going to be, although free, was going to be sorely divided. So at last the British Raj sailed away. It was not quite 200 years since Clive had won his famous victory at Plassey, not quite 100 years since the Indian Mutiny. A moment comes, said Nehru, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new, when an age ends, and when the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance. As you think back to what India was like in January 1948, I think perhaps it was inevitable 
in this atmosphere of hatred, bloodshed, and violence, that the man who is preaching love should be betrayed by hate. On January 30th, 1948, as Gandhi walked to his evening prayer meeting, a young Hindu fanatic pumped three bullets into his frail body. He died, as he had hoped, with the name of God on his lips. So Gandhi is dead. Soul force, nonviolence, in effect, they're dead too, because you can't build a country on those ideals. When I go back to India, it's obvious that India has the same problems of frustration, the same problems in trying to build a country that any other country has, and it's facing them in pretty much the same ways. So perhaps in retrospect, it's best that Gandhi died when he did, a Mahatma and a martyr. This is the All India Radio. Prime Minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. Friends and comrades, the light has gone out of our lives and there is darkness everywhere. And I do not quite know what to tell you and how to say it. Our beloved leader, Bapu as we called him, the father of the nation, is no more. Gandhi's last fast had been an act of self-purification for all his people.